colleagues. Uh, I have the, the great privilege of uh, serving as Vice President of Institutional Advancements. Short to you, my name is Ramin Shablandi. I know I've met many of you. I'm in my fourth month, I think, here in the uh, great city of Tiffin, and uh, we're absolutely thrilled uh, that you're here today. So, um, a few folks I'd like to recognize uh, for getting up bright and early on this brisk morning. And that is, uh, we have one of our trustees on hand, uh, Dan Reinecke. Dan, uh, thank you for uh, being here this morning. And then, and then uh, a couple other folks that really helped this community uh, move forward in very important ways. Uh, we, have, we have David Zack from SIDEC and uh, John Detweiler from the Chamber. So, John and... And, um, you know... It, Early on, it's been really early since I've only been here a few months, uh, folks have really talked about the, the transformation of, of Tiffin University and all this newness that's happened around the campus over the last uh, couple of decades have been just fantastic. But I have to say, this Good Morning World has been going on now for 34 years. And so what, what a wonderful investment, not only into the university community, but also the, uh, the, uh, the community of Tiffin and Seneca County. So uh, as we get going, uh, the official welcome will be given by our president, Dr. Lillian Schumacher. And so I'll ask her to come up and say a few words. Lillian. Thank you, Mitch, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early today. I love seeing a full room. And um, I get why. I think Rudy will not disappoint this morning. So um, we are very, very honored to have him here. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, just from speaking with him a little bit this morning, um, I think you all will be extremely engaged in his uh, presentation to us. So as Mitch said, this has been going on as a tradition at our institution for over three decades now. And we really, really appreciate the community that makes it a priority to be here today. So thank you for that. Um, and enjoy. I hope you've had some breakfast and um, enjoy the morning. So good morning world will continue. Have a wonderful day and let's uh, without further ado have Mitch introduce Rudy Rudiger, Rudiger to us today. So Mr. Daniel Rudy Rudiger spent his early days, his early college career Probably, what, in 27 seconds, one play, I understand, becoming three plays, becoming one of the most recognizable Notre Dame graduates. It inspired, obviously, a movie, a book. He spent years walking around, touring around the country, being an inspiration to so many. He uh, has earned an honorary, an honorary doctorate from Our Lady of Holy Cross. He's spoken at the White House during the presidencies of George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. And uh, one of the more interesting facts, I thought, uh, was that he's the son of an oil refinery worker and is the third of 14 children. And so when I, I heard that, I thought, boy, if his mom was here today, she could probably give us a lesson or two on perseverance, right? Yeah. So uh, we're thrilled to have Rudy here on campus. Uh, he'll uh, talk uh, to us uh, for about an hour. Afterwards, I understand there will be books uh, available for purchase, and so uh, please uh, help me give Rudy a very warm Tiffin welcome. Uh, by the way, Tiffin Cobb and Mall, that's good, Madison. Uh, 
I'm the real Rudy, just so you know. <laughs> Madison's great. It's exciting. Student senior, right? Working our way through school. I love it. Um, met a lot of wonderful people here at the table last night. It was wonderful. Community. Met a lot of great people. Met a 93-year-old uh, gentleman and went to 426 games. He's got every ticket. The only game he missed was my game. <laughs> the only game he missed. <laughs> but uh, it, it's funny because a lot of people ask me a lot of questions about the movie Notre Dame, who's what, and I think that's why the book is exciting when you read it. <laughs> You'll see how the movie was made, why the movie was made, and how the movie came about. So, saying that, uh, I don't want to waste your time other than tell you some feelings that I have about why I do what I do. Uh, I, I do what I do because I think it's important. I didn't want to work for a living. I wanted to enjoy my work. So there was a difference. I used to work and I didn't like that. Uh, I saw the people happy in work as I wanted to do that. That's what I wanted to do. I like that choo-choo train. Um, it, that was in my, my, I said, why are they happy and I'm not happy? I'm working swing shift. I know why I'm not happy, because I didn't do well in school. I graduated third of my class in high school. That's why I'm not happy. I was a dummy in high school. That's why I'm not happy, because I was third of my class from the bottom, and I can't fulfill my dream. That's why I'm not happy. That's what bothered me. Why can't I go to Notre Dame? Why? Because you're a dummy. You can't go to Notre Dame because you don't have the grades, aptitude, you don't have the skill set. You can't play football at Notre Dame. You don't have the ability. They're not, you're not a candidate for Notre Dame. You're, you don't even run the 40 and, and 5 8. Now, that's you know how fast they, they kind of time me. And I argued with them. I told them I was 5 6. And, and, you know, so we had that argument with the so-called coaches that will yell out your time. And they would always say, hey, Rudy, get off your knee. You know, that coach. I said, I am. You know, so you get those thoughts and you get angry. You say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm 6'5 in my dreams. I don't look at myself as a 5 foot 6 guy. In the classroom, I said, I'm smart, but I can't take that test like, this valedictorian kid or that smart kid. I, why can't I be like that? Why well, I have a learning disorder called dyslexia. And I, I'll never forget how I learned about it. I didn't know I had, I just thought it was stupid because in fifth grade, that's where it all came about. You know, fourth grade, how many people love fourth grade and are just curious? None of you, you have done, that's the best, wasn't it? The teacher was awesome. Are you, weren't you guys excited about fourth grade? No? no? Really? Yeah, I know it's early. <laughs> but you gotta get excited about something in your past, right? I hated fifth grade. In my, you know why? They gave us homework. Here's my mandate today. You like it? I talked to 350 other educators, let me put it that way, <laughs> principals. I said, when I come back next year, I want homework banned from your school. Banned. No homework. And they look. I said, really? It's stupid. Homework's stupid. And they look. I said, have them read 20 minutes a day. They're not ready. How are they going to... Let me say something to you all. I was so stressed with homework. And my kids are so stressed for homework. They want to sing, they want to dance. Don't get nervous. I'm going to get back how important education is. <laughs> Relax. Rudy comes from everywhere. All right? You're going to see how important education is through this example. People learn when they're inspired. They will learn anything and everything they need to know when they're inspired. They can't learn when they're tired. They can't learn when they're grumpy. And they can't learn when they're not happy. It's when they're happy. It's when they learn and when they're inspired. Oh, Rudy, you got to be real. Listen, fourth grade was awesome. 
Are you kidding? I wanted to be everything and anything. Because my teacher said I could. Fifth grade, the teacher gave me homework. The night I was playing homework and derby in my neighborhood. And I was a Yankee. I was Mickey Mantle. And tonight, Thursday night, is the night that I'm going to beat all the other Yankees and I'm going to be the home run derby king. I was focused on that. I was so excited about that. But she got mad at me because that's all I talked about in that school. I went home. She said, you need to know those presidents tomorrow. And you better learn the first five because you're going to have a quiz. I didn't go home and study. I played home run derby. And I was the king of home run. I was the guy. I don't know if you're excited about that, but I was. <laughs> I come to school the next day, and I was even more excited. And the teacher saw how excited I was. And she, didn't, she knew I didn't do my homework. Now here's it between a leader and a non-leader. Between a coach and a leading coach. Between a teacher and a great teacher. They will recognize character, association, and dreams, and how to put that together. How to associate their dream with what they want done with that student. If that teacher would have said, now Rudy, Pay attention here. I'm good. <laughs> I love people when they look at me. Right, Doc? When they get to, I'll, I'll come right at you like my teacher did. Don't you hate that? <laughs> That's what she did. So I'm just giving you a little feeling of how I felt. <clears throat> I was bragging about home run derby. Now she would have said, now, Rudy, the first five batters for the Yankees are the first five presidents. I would have gone home and studied him. Right? Right? Wouldn't you? Yeah. She didn't. So she embarrassed me in front of all my friends in school and asked me the fifth president of the United States in front of all my classmates. Does anybody in this room, all at once, I'm going to count to three, give me the fifth president of the United States. Ready? One, all at once now. Two, three. James Rollins. Who said that? You were at my speech last night. Yeah. <laughs> Either you had to do the song to learn them, right? How'd you learn to fit president? Helping my kids study president. See, yeah, there you go. He's a, he's a winger. But give him a hand anyhow. He's the only smart guy. James Monroe. You did? Yep. Really? You did, yep. sir? How did you learn? I'm just curious. Hard study. Hard. Nah. <laughs> How did you learn? Hard study. Uh, it was one of my fa uh, favorite uh, subjects. There you go. Right there. And he learned them, right? Isn't that exciting? Now, what happened to you guys? <laughs> You're like me. You know how old I was when I found out the fifth president? 45 years of age. <laughs> and the president of the United States asked me to come to the White House to have dinner and show the movie Rudy. And I still didn't know the fifth president. <laughs> you think he called, he had his staff call me and see if Rudy knew the fifth president? <laughs> no, he could care less what I knew. Because he knew I cared. He knew I struggled. He knew I overcame. He knew I was persevering. He knew I had to come from somewhere to get to where I got. And he respected that. It was called character. So he invited me to the White House because of that. Isn't that neat? When I went to the White House, you know, the first thing I saw, this is, but there's a little story behind that story. Now, we don't talk politics in here, right? Good. We don't talk uh, negative stuff in here, right? That's why Tiffins, when I drove up tonight, felt good energy, great school, great people, provost, awesome. My, the leader of the, you're, you're awesome. And really, she's a ball of fire, man. And you gotta love your position here. Trust me, you're, you're, you, you 
present the school well, you're good looking, beautiful. <laughs> I, don't have I, can't even, I can't even talk right, but man, look at your shoes are shining. Man, you got it all going for you. <laughs> it's, isn't it awesome to have that energy? It's because we don't mix, we have dreams here. We have goals. We, we, we teach different. We, we give, we, we encourage. Now, 1993, October 1st, I get a phone call from the White House. Now, let me back up before I answer that call. I'm one of 14. Seven sisters, six brothers. We fought early. I learned how to fight early in my life. We fought. My brothers and I, every morning we woke up over stupid things. Socks, underwear, shoes. That's mine. That's mine. We fought. I don't know if you grew up in a big family. I, don't know if you had, I had gratitude when I got my own underwear for the first time. <laughs> I don't know if you did, but I did. You know, I, I was so excited. The drill instructor I went in the Navy looked at me like I was crazy because I was so excited when he gave me my underwear. But I didn't tell him I was excited. Because you don't tell people your victories because they'll steal your joy from you. So I never tell my victories to people. I'm just excited. And they feel that excitement. They also feel your pride. You see, when I fought for my underwear in the playground in school, the teachers would never break up our fights. I want you to let the Rudiger boys fight, because they're weird. <laughs> they fight over stupid things. Literally, it would tear our underwear off my brothers so I could have my... Uh, is that weird? <laughs> but that's how we grew up, in, re in the real world. My mother was awesome. She's a great, great, I call her Saint Elizabeth. She was awesome. Always smiling. My dad was grumpy, because he worked three jobs. My mother, when things got bad, would sing Danny Boy. Oh, Danny Boy. I mean, it was I had to sing that the other night in Las Vegas with Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers because we're raising money for the, I don't know, the poor people who got killed in Las Vegas by that horrific shooting. And we're raising money for the victims, and I'm going, I wouldn't be here if my mother didn't sing those songs. I wouldn't be here if my mother said, you can be anybody you want to be. My dad was very protective. Because when we went to church on Sunday, all of us, all 14 of us, 16 count my mom and dad in one car. <laughs> Plymouth Furry. You, you, you didn't have seat belts. You were in the wheel wells. <laughs> you were all over the place. You stuffed yourself in that big. Remember the big Plymouth Furries with the big, yeah, yeah you're my age, you know. Right? You young people wouldn't know that, but man, you, everybody, you could put 40 people in that car. You go to church, and my dad would make a goofy statement. God bless, because he goes to breakfast with his friends and they talk politics, <laughs> religion, people down the street. And they come home mad <clears throat> until the wheel of fortune is on or the price is right and his attitude changed. I've always recognized when something is about dreams and something you could dream about, he got excited. But the reality is he's got to go to work, right? He's got to stress out, work three jobs. He's got to put up with the kids. <laughs> and tough deal when he says, we're driving down the road and he would say, don't look at that guy. He's Protestant. You will go to hell. <laughs> That's how we went to church. In fear. I wouldn't look at anybody. Literally. Stiff underwear and all, man. I was the guy that folded the underwear because I had to because I had a bad report card. That was my consequence. Shine shoes. Fold underwear and make the beds. And I was good at it. Because <laughs> my teacher made me sit in the back of the room and I didn't know that fit president. So I focused on what I couldn't do. I didn't know I had dyslexia. They didn't know about dyslexia. I remember the teacher when I took my entrance test to get to high school. This is amazing. My mom, my dad, the, the teacher, the principal comes out. Oh, your kid's uh, really slow. <laughs> 
She's not that smart. My mother says, you know what? You're an ass. <laughs> my kid is smart. There's <laughs> nothing wrong with my kid. He's not going to this school, so I went to the other school. God bless her. That's where I got my edge. You got to fight. You don't let anybody call your kid stupid. You're not stupid. God wouldn't put you on this earth. You're not stupid. Everybody has something to offer. Everyone has a skill. Everyone has something. It's called attitude. If that's what you have, that's all you got. That's what I'm watching a blind man in the at the hotel I was staying at this morning. A blind man. This guy had so much gratitude. And he had all his assistants around him. And he's with his cane going to breakfast. Says, Come on. I didn't know he was blind at the time. I said, Boy, that guy's too happy. <laughs> he just has gratitude. Because he's with his people. He's doing what he wants to do. He has a beautiful suit on. He looked, I mean, perfect. Then I saw he was blind. So I spoke to a blind organization once. I didn't realize they were blind. They were so excited. They had so much skills. I mean, they were good at what they did because they focused on what they can do. Kind of like what I did. Once I learned, you know what? I am not stupid. Because after the high school, I went to work and I didn't like what I was doing. So I joined the Navy because of Vietnam. Went to the Navy and first thing they did to you was cut all your hair, hair off. Remember that? I ain't military in here. Remember that? Give those guys a hand. It's a game changing moment. Here's why. Everybody looked the same. It was everybody looked, oh wow. When you were first there, everybody looked, wow, look at that weird guy. All of a sudden, hair it goes right, right? They take all your clothes away, then they give you a new issue. This is where the game changing starts. Your life changes right in front of you. When your issue, brand new underwear, <laughs> brand new now, not used, new, you get excited. <laughs> and when they stamp your name on the back, you get more excited because the dude next to you can't steal your underwear <laughs> like your brother would. So my whole life has changed. This is awesome, right? Drill instructor came by and saw my foot locker. He didn't ask me if I knew the fifth president. He saw what order I had and how well I folded my underwear and my shoes and my rack. He says, you're the leader of all these shipmates. I became a leader that moment. And my whole attitude changed. And I got confidence because of what he did to me. I start dreaming again. When you have confidence, you dream. We steal people's confidence through words, through moments, because we don't feel right or things aren't going our way. So I'll make him feel bad or her feel bad so I can feel good. Actually, it's called bullying, if you want to know the truth. We bully without knowing. We shouldn't bully. I, I learned it. Being positive is more effective than being negative. Being positive attracts great people around you. <laughs> you know, it's great. I've been speaking for 24 years and I can't speak. I'm not a good speaker. Some guy told me that. I, I know. <laughs> Just between you and I, I'm speaking, you're not. So go have a seat. <laughs> difference of attitude, right? People all want to criticize you. Oh, Rudy wasn't very good at Notre Dame. He only made one tackle. Oh, he used it one tackle. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It took 27 years to play 27 seconds, dude. Yeah, I, it was worth it. How many people abandoned their dream along the way because some bozo said to them, you can't do that. I made it because someone says you can. I made it because the leader of a university, a small one called Holy Cross Junior College. It's now a university. It's now a university. It was a junior college when I showed up because when my friend died, I looked at life. Life is very short. And I'll never forget what the guy said to me right before he died. Don't live in regret. Rudy, get out of here. Those words stuck with me. 
And I said, you're right, he's right. So I went towards the dream instead of away from my dream. I had no idea how I was going to get to Notre Dame, but I'm going for it. And I'm going to find out how to get there now. Because what the Navy taught me was a thing called collaboration. Remember that, guys? How to collaborate? So you didn't have to be that smart. <laughs> There's a lot of smart people around you collaborating with those guys. Find out what they know so you get to know me. You need to know that I'll help you get to where you need to go. Why didn't they teach that to me in school? I would have passed. <laughs> I would have been the valedictorian. <laughs> they made me sit in the back of the room because I didn't know the fifth president. Hmm. Something's wrong with this deal. Oh, here's what's fun now. You need to go through life and struggle a little bit in order to help people. If you have a dream, you're going to struggle. You're going to get hit, but you better get up. You're going to be challenged, but can you get up? If you have a negative attitude, you won't get up. You'll have excuses, and why? I quit hanging around people with excuses and quit hanging around the why guy. You ever hang around the why guy? Why are you doing this? Why are you being that? Why do you think like that? <laughs> Holy cow. I just, maybe he's right. So once I stopped hanging around that why guy, I hung around this guy. When are we doing it, Rudy? When are you doing it? Let's go. Because you don't look for problems. They're already here. <laughs> They're right here. It's how to solve them. You can solve them. Don't look for them. You won't move forward. Solve them as they show up. Because you're good. You can do that. You're resilient. You can make that happen. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> that little technique works. So I don't analyze. I don't figure out why I should do it. I just do it. And because of positive attitude, you attract the positive people. You see the opportunities. You embrace them and say, you know, I don't know what you know, but I need for you to help me. And they do. The winners will. The losers won't. So you don't hang around losers. You hang around winners. And I guess that's what Notre Dame was to me. Winners. The people at that junior college, a little brother, when I walked into the school, I'll never forget, said, Brother John, my name's Rudy Rudiger, and I was in the Navy. He said, wonderful. I said, you know, brother, I was bad in high school. I got terrible grades, but I want to go to Notre Dame. He said, stop right there. I don't care what you did in the past. I'm worried about right now. What can we do right now, Rudy? I said, I want to go to Notre Dame. I can grace. So don't worry about that. You'll get A's and B's here. I said, really? <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry about it. He took that pressure right off. I said, how do you get an A, brother? So come to class every day. Really? Well, how do you get a B if you don't show up? I <laughs> said, okay, I never miss class. But I failed my first four tests. I said, brother, something's wrong. You told me to go to class every day and I failed the first four tests. Oh, don't worry about it. I said, go build relationships with your professor. Oh, he forgot to tell me that step now. He tells me, build a relationship with your professor. Have him help you. So I start initiating what I learned in the Navy now asking for help and collaborate. And it worked. Magnum cum laude, Rudy Rudiger. Aren't you impressed? <laughs> you look like academic people. <laughs> well, you still don't have that SAT. Never took them. <laughs> you don't need them if you go to junior college. Well, that's not true today, Rudy. I think, you know, I taught you, I never took them. I graduated from Notre Dame because I did what the Brother John told me to do. Go bug the administrators. <laughs> Let them know every time you got turned out who you are. Stand in front of the dean's office. Let them know what you want. I was there every day because I was across, right across the street. Now, everybody can't do what I do, but everybody can be what they want if they do what I kind of do. Does that make sense? <laughs> when I went for my first job, they told me I didn't have enough experience. Insurance? And I listened to, okay, how do you get experience, I asked the guy. He says, you got to be around him. 
I never left that office. <laughs> so he hired me. I stood in a lobby. And he me eight in the morning. Seven at night. He comes, what are you doing? And I hired you. Then I talked to you. Yes, sir. You told me to stick around. I'm not leaving till you hire me. I said, oh, you're hired. <laughs> and that's how I got Rudy the movie made, the same way. That's how I got to Notre Dame, because the dean asked me every time he saw me, why are you here every day? My name's Rudy Rudiger. I know who you are. But you don't have to be here every day. I said, I know. The day I get in, you don't, won't see me. <laughs> he just shakes his head. And, you know. and the secretaries are awesome. <clears throat> Hey, now make sure my application comes in, you put it on top. <laughs> or make sure the right guy gets it. I don't know if that happened, but I would build that. Everyone, there was a little, this guy from Holy Cross keeps coming. And they start liking me. Oh, here's, hi, Rudy. Hi, how you doing? And all of a sudden, the students at Notre Dame thought I was going to school there. <laughs> they put me on the student government. <laughs> I wasn't, I never told them different. Why would I tell them? I was head of the social department. I mean, I knew everybody. I knew every girl on campus. I was no threat to them. They liked me. And all the other guys said, well, how come you know all the girls? Because I just want to help them. You, you're up. You're goofy. They think you're goofy. I'm going to follow you around. Just be nice. Be a gentleman. For my mom time. It's unbelievable how the girls help you do papers. <laughs> And get things done. They're smarter than us. They're more organized. Right? Or you're lucky you have a woman in charge, I'm telling you. You can dress all the best you want, but man, that's it, right? It's amazing. I learned, boy, if I could collaborate with the smart girls here, I could I could graduate from Notre Dame, but I, I got rejected a couple of times. Are we okay? Yeah. Boy, when you're leaving, I said, okay. When people get up, I get nervous. I don't know if they're going to leave or man. It's like the guy in the White House talking during my movie. I was going to smack him. <laughs> Good thing I did. It was Larry King sitting next to me. So you never, I learned not to judge. <laughs> relax. Be relaxed. You know, it's funny. If you take pictures, <laughs> take the side. Oh, girl, you got to get in that gym. <laughs> But it's fun. When I, my journey was fun. I was living a dream at Notre Dame. I was living a movie is my point. I didn't know that. See, the day I got in Notre Dame, I'll never forget how the coach remembered me. The head coach. This is absolutely another game changer. He saw me laying on the field. I got hit pretty hard. And he goes, well, I said, kid, you all right? And he looked at me. Hey, Gene, Gene, the equipment manager, this kid, get a helmet that fits the kid, please, and give him some gold pants. See, when you're walk on, you don't get the real equipment. <laughs> you get hand-me-downs. You know why he asked that and said that? He remembered me walking into his office at 6 a.m. in the morning. Tell him, I'm going to play football for you someday, coach. My name's Rudy Rudiger. And you know what he said? You know why he was a winner? He said, when you get come, when you get in, you come and see me. Well, he saw me. <laughs> Laying on the ground. Are you that kid that walked in my office? I said, yes, sir. He said, give him the right equipment. You see, it pays off. When you think you're embarrassing yourself when you want, you're not. You're making a statement. People recognize character and courage. The winners do. Now the losers won't. They'll make fun of you. They'll put you down. Why do you want to hang around him anyhow? Hang around winners. And great things happen. I know what I say is complicated, complex. I get it. But I simplify my life. I just hang around people that like me. And there's people that don't trust me. I don't read the internet. I don't read newspapers. Rudy slurs when he speaks. Rudy has a lisp. You can't walk. I'm still getting paid, so it doesn't matter, right? So who cares what I have? Let's try to slur. Who cares, right? People like it. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, you can't be perfect. There's nobody perfect. You're never perfect. My mother and dad, I thought, were perfect. They never argued in front of I never saw them argue. 
How can you not argue in front of 14 kids? Right? How many married couples in here? Do you argue? I hope so. If you don't, there's something wrong, right? If you don't argue, you never get out what? Your feelings. But my mother and dad argued, and I didn't know they argued, because I never saw them argued. And I asked her, how do you and dad have a perfect marriage? You know what she says? We do not have a perfect marriage, son. But you never argue. Yes, we do. We argue all the time. She was one of those spitfires. I said, okay. Your dad and I made a commitment to each other, never to argue in front of your children. You don't need to hear our differences. Your dad needs to hear how I feel about him, and he needs to hear, I need to hear how he feels about me, and we compromise. It's okay. We argue upstairs in the bedroom. It's okay. Got it. Then she says, she smiles, she says, why do you think there's 14 of you? That's <laughs> kind of like, okay, mom. <laughs> Get it, right? That's why I call my mom. I got that phone call from the White House. Now here's the big deal. You got to know a little bit of the past. You got to know who the positive one is in order to get things done. You don't go to the negative. You don't call someone when you're down. You don't call someone when you, you got goofy thinking. <laughs> Look at you call someone when you have good energy, when you feel good, when you drain all the goofy thoughts out of your head and now you're up and you're excited. Sometimes you got to take a little time to do that because you want to make an impression and you want to feel good about what you're doing and you don't want people to feel your goofy thoughts, right? So there, it's called timing. You got to take care of yourself. You got to learn how to get ready. You got to meditate. You got to drain the goofy stuff because it's around us so, and it's absorbed and you got to learn how to do that and you got to unplug it and just let it go and all of a sudden you're positive because you saw something that inspired you and you get inspired and now you do it. And that's reality. That's reality. Because there's a lot of goofy stuff that we hear and that we see and we go to school man, we go to church man and there's people out here mad at me right now because you don't know what I'm going through Rudy, I don't care. <laughs> but I do know you can be better than what you are because I can too. Just get rid of your goofy thoughts and be the person you want to be and help people become what they want to be by encouraging them. But that's why I, when I got that phone call in 1993 I had to put the call on pause. Because this young lady who was a producer on her set, could, took 10 years to make the movie, by the way. I know her name barred me from campus, literally. Made me sign a letter, do not walk on this campus again, talk about this movie, or you will be disowned <laughs> or disassociated. And I had to sign that letter. I didn't abandon the, the dream. I kept it, but I quit going to see that guy that wrote, maybe sign that letter, because I thought he was the guy I should go. And I guess I was paying the buck to him. Put it on pause, like I put the phone call on pause. I thought, okay, I'm going to get it done, but I don't know how yet, because I need, I do know what I did. I could help a lot of people. People need to see this and they have children that need to know if they work hard, make the right friends and do the right thing, they can become better people. I know that, but I gotta show that. I could do it in a movie because a guy in the locker room that saw me play, who was a sports writer, saw me take my uniform off, come walking over to my bench. I didn't have a locker, I had a stool. <laughs> Everyone had a locker, I had a stool. He said, no. what's your name? I said, Rudy Rudiger. Say, I know, they're chanting Rudy. I've never seen you. They don't even know you. Oh, they know me, I said. But I didn't tell him that. I said, those students up there knew who I was, and they chanted Rudy, not football. The students did. I didn't tell him that, because they didn't know that. I won the bingo box. He didn't know that. I fought, beat the big guys, beat the football players, and the students loved the little Rocky type of guy, <laughs> the little guy that couldn't, wouldn't get beat. I was like Popeye. <laughs> they like that. 
They liked the underdog. That's who chanted for Rudy. He didn't understand that. So he said, you know, this stuff only happens in Hollywood. I don't know if you take that as a criticism, I turn it as a positive. I said, yeah, he's right. He didn't have no idea what he did. So years later, uh, I see Rocky, 1976, and the movie came alive. And Field of Dreams, and Hoosiers. I said, oh my gosh, that's my movie. I could do a movie, because I always intrigued with movies. I'm getting to that phone call, trust me. <laughs> Just give me some backup so you know how I'm thinking. I got to put her on pause because what I went through to get the movie made and finally I, uh, there was a guy from Michigan State, believe it or not, Michigan State at $25 million. He was the president of Columbia Pictures. Green light and Rudy. <laughs> a guy from Michigan State. They taught us to hate guys from Michigan State. <laughs> this guy from Michigan State, you know why? He wanted another movie like Hoosiers. So he called those guys in from Hoosiers to see if they had another sports story. Now thank the Lord. When I got turned down the final time at Notre Dame, I met a hotel manager that asked me, basically asked me how the meeting go. I was honest, no good, Notre Dame. The meeting lasted about as long as I played, I said. <laughs> I said, well, what happened? He said, he came in, he said, we're Notre Dame. And we told Rudy, we love Rudy, but we told him a hundred times, no. And Frank Capper Jr. was there, and, and Frank Capper Jr. said, look, I took a red eye to come out here and, and tell you why this story should be told. He said, Mr. Capper, we love you, we love your father, but we're Notre Dame and we don't need another movie. We have New Rockney, All-American, the Kipper. I said, okay. Frank Capper looked at me, he said, that when I got off the road, he said, Rudy, I can't help you, but you will get this done. I said, how do you know? I see it in your eyes. You'll get it done. He gave me that word. I walked and met a hotel manager. A hotel manager said, after he asked me how the meeting went, he says, my brother's coming to town. I want you to talk to him. See, God has a special way of putting people in front of him when you're positive and you embrace those positive feelings. So I told his brother the story. We had a pizza. You know what the brother said? That's a movie. So how do you know? So we put Hoosiers together. <laughs> you never know who knows someone, right? I said, you're a kid. I've been looking for that guy for eight years. All I needed to know was a hotel manager that liked me. This is, I thought I needed a big shot, a lawyer, an agent. All you need to know is someone that knows someone that likes you. It could be anybody. Oh, yeah. So the guy says, will you go out and meet Angelo Pizzo? I said, yeah. The guy who wrote Hoosiers. Do you know, I went into my boss's office. I needed another day off, sir. He said, no, Rudy, you got to quit chasing that stupid dream. You got to work. I said, I know, but this thing inside, I got to go back. He said, okay, go, but don't come back. You're not allowed here anymore. He fired me. But I still went to California. <laughs> and you know what happened? Great things happened. But not right away. But here's how you handle the obstacle. I went out to California, sitting in an Italian restaurant, eight tables. Picture yourself in an Italian restaurant and eight tables, and nobody shows up for four hours. What would you do? Would you complain? Why? Make an excuse? Ask your friend, is the guy going to show up? No, the guy is going to show up because they taught me in insurance, be patient. <laughs> and I used that little skill set. My buddy who didn't have it was complaining. So I asked, can you just be quiet without telling him to be quiet? I said, excuse me, I'll be right back. I went outside to refresh my attitude because i got to get away from that goofiness. Refresh my attitude. I saw a black male man smiling, whistling, and happy. I said, dude, thank you for that. I needed that. You know what he said? 
where are you from? <laughs> no one's ever thanked me for my what I do. I said, sir, you made my morning, man. I said, I needed someone. I needed a smile. I said, you got gratitude, brother. He said, well, I could be in Michigan passing you know, stuff out in the snow. That's where I'm from. Where are you from? I said, Indiana. And he liked me because I'm Midwest. <laughs> We had a connection. And he asked me why I was out here. And I told him. So I hear a lot of those stories. But tell me your story. You know, I told him the 30,000 foot version. You know what he said? He got so passionate. He said, come with me. He said, where are we going? Just come with me. He said, what are you doing? He said, I know where that guy lives. <laughs> I said, you can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. You're going to, I know where that guy lives. You got a great story. You got to tell him. I said, you're kidding. You're not supposed to do this. He says, I know. He brought me right to his door. Knocked on the door. Can you imagine? Think about this. You knocking on a guy's door that stood you up. You know what he said? Who is this? I said, Rudy. He said, how'd you find me? He said, never mind. I wanted to think that mailman, he was gone. He was an angel. I believe God puts angels in your life. Anybody, they're angels. People, well, they're angels. And I looked for him. I wanted to thank him because Mr. Pizzo said, I'm not going to do another sports story, Rudy. Uh, I, I'm going to change genres. <laughs> I said, genres, what's that mean? <laughs> and he explained it because I wanted him to explain that. What do you mean, genres? He wanted to do like, yeah, I'm doing Navy SEALs right now. I said, okay. No more sports movies. He said, okay. I said, but why did you have me come all the way out here and you didn't show up? Because I was up all night re-rock writing. And besides, I hate Notre Dame. The arrogance of him. But I liked him. Because you know what he said? You have a good story. I eliminated the negative of him and focused on the positive. Two years later, I go back to South Bend. I had to get a new job. My own work. Cut grass, shovel snow. Do you know my friends would drive by as I'm shoveling, cutting grass? Hey, Rudy! You know the negative people? How's that movie going? Oh, dude, I need help. <laughs> we got a lot of snow here. Can you help me? Ha, 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 ha. You know the first people at the premiere were? They were there. Because they say, oh, I knew you could do it. Everybody wants to jump on your bandwagon when you make it. But the ones who encourage it, they just wish you the best. So I say to you, as I found out how this movie got made because this Michigan State guy, if I didn't find that mailman, didn't talk to that hotel manager, that Michigan State guy would never heard the story, right? So... What you think is insignificant is significant. When you say hi to someone, is significant. When you thank someone, is real. When you let people know about their joy, let them know. You don't know who's going to help you get to where you need to go. You know, when that phone did ring, it goes ding-a-ling, ding-a-ling, ding-a-ling. Remember those? pick it up on the third ding a -ling. Now, how do you answer the phone when you pick it up? That's your key to success. Rudy. Rudy here. Why are you so excited, they would say. But this phone call, you never know who's on the other end of the phone, right? You never know. It's Nicole, the little producer, assistant producer, went back to Washington, D.C. after the movie was wrapped. And she met a guy who happens to be the first lady's brother. She gets engaged. They're at dinner. And the president of the United States asked Nicole, what have you been doing, Nicole? She says, I've been working on an underdog movie. Really excited about it. This kid wasn't supposed to go to Notre Dame. Wasn't even come blah, blah, blah. She go on. And the president, I want to see that movie. 
We have a tradition here at the White House to show a movie every Friday when I'm in town. I want to see Rudy. Get Rudy. The movie hasn't even come out to the public yet. They brought the movie to the White House. Try to start pictures. She calls and asks. <laughs> when the president gave her a, like a call of duty, <laughs> call Rudy, get him here. She calls me and I'm excited because it's Nicole. Because she was always exciting on set, always helping people get to what they needed to get. Great servant leader. I said, Rudy, I'm so excited. You won't believe what happened last night. I said, what, Nicole? I said, you're going to the White House. I said, what do you mean? Yeah, the president wants you to come to the White House and he wants to know if you're busy two weeks from Friday. I pause. Now, if you got that call, how would you act? Would you get excited? Would you? I had to put her on pause. I had a goofiest thought. I said, I can't go. I can't go. But I can't tell her that. I don't want to tell her my goofy thoughts. I got to get rid of my goofy thought. My mother said, if you got a goofy thought, put it on pause, pray. So I said, Nicole, I prayed. I said, okay, call me tomorrow, 9 a.m. My secretary will be here. I had no secretary. <laughs> a buddy did. I knew he had one. He could help me out, right? That one guy. And I never asked me why. So I needed to do that. Okay, I want to go to the White House. I want to meet the president. I want to be in the movie. Oh, yeah, but ah, my dad. Oh, my gosh, i got to get over this with my dad. I can't tell my dad. i got to call my mother because my dad hates that president. What am I going to do? So i got to call my mother because she inspires my father. That's what i got to do. So I call mom and say, Mom, get dad up in the bedroom and tell him go to the White House. Boom. <laughs> Because he calls me the next morning after the secretary makes all the arrangements. I'll never forget the secretary. But come over so excited because she knew the White House was calling. Uh, she said, what do I say? What do I say? I said, I don't know. I really don't know. But you sound good, though. Okay, okay. That phone rings right at 9 o'clock. And it's a social director. And, they're making, and she's making all the arrangements. I even heard her. She says, when she answered the phone, she said, Rudy International. Wow, oh my God, that's awesome. She's going on and on about how good I am and how powerful I am. Really? But she's not, because I told her to do that. And you know, she made all those arrangements. I get to go to the White House, you know why? Because my mother did her magic. My dad calls, so I know where you're going, and I know I can't stop you. I'm going to end my speech with this song. I'm going to show you something here. Because <laughs> I know you. What time, how much time we got? Four, four minutes. Okay, real quick. All right, real. I know. We got to do this. He said, just right out runs the White House. Goodbye. I go to the White House. The President of the United States meets me, shaking my hand. I looked right over his shoulder. I was so excited. You know what it's like when you're 45 years old and you're the president of a president and all his guest vice president, everybody that's there, they're honoring you and you walk in and you're focused on the wall because all the presidential pictures are hanging up. I did a rewind back to fifth grade. I want to know that fifth president. Because my fifth grade teacher wasn't invited, but I was. I want to know that fifth president before I go see that movie, right? I counted the fifth picture. It was James Monroe. And I did not tell that president I knew the president. You know why? He didn't care what I knew. He doesn't care. He knew I cared. Winners feel character. You know, we all have our flaws. We all have our issues. But when you're positive, you overlook them. And we all become one. I saw it every time we had a tragedy. I saw people come together. I saw them in Vegas. My son's classmates were shot. And a fireman carried both of those kids on his shoulder out of there and went back for more. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't stand for our flag, there's something wrong. 
Yes, I believe in free speech. Yes, we do make mistakes. Right or wrong, I went to Vietnam. Right or wrong, I fought so you could be here. Right or wrong, we go to serve. Because it's our country, our freedom. So, to say no more of that, just can I end it with this video and we're done? <laughs> Madison, that's it. If you guys don't believe this happened, just watch this and I'm out of here. <laughs> is, she, is she great? Where did you go, Madison? <laughs> shows the guys giving the jerseys down and walking in there. <clears throat> there was a guy by uh, played with us, his name was Pat Sarp. And it kind of an interesting story because Pat did go into uh, see Coach Devine. And back then they had a, a, a ruling, there was only a certain amount of people that could dress for a game. And at that stage that was all you could do. So it was important to have the, the right people dress. And so, but this was senior day and everything like that, and it was a great day for everybody. And so what Pat went in and saw uh, Coach Devine and said, hey, I, I'm not gonna play. I know you're on the, you know, on the sideline. Could you have Rudy dress in my spot? And of course, he agreed to do it. And Actually, a nice little story about that. I think 20 some years later, his young son walked out and wore, wore Rudy's number 45, and he played on the special teams for four years here. Okay. So it was a really unique story that carried on forward after that. <laughs> and sharing that and, uh, over and over and over again, whether it's your story, whether it's the stories that we hear on this campus, uh, or you can go across the nation and hear about how inspiring, how believing in, how just taking the time to invest in a person can make the difference, right? You see it over, over, and over again. So we thank you very much. It's a life lesson that, uh, that we all need to be reminded of. Uh, very frequently. So uh, we are in our 34th season here with Good Morning World. Uh, our next speaker will be Ann Shoket, who has been a key architect in shaping the national conversation about and for millennial women. She served as editor-in-chief of Seventeen Magazine from 2007 to 2014, and she's uh, made appearances frequently on programs like Good Morning America, Today, The Oprah Winfrey Show, The View, CNN, Access Hollywood, and E! News. And so we're thrilled to, to bring her as our next uh, presenter here in a few months. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, share with everyone here in the room, uh, all those community members, that this beautiful space, this Marion Center, is available for your next gathering or reception. So make sure if that's something that you'd be interested in. I see some smiles here. Maybe there are wedding plans or, or whatnot. Uh, Sandy back here and event services uh, will be happy to uh, talk to you about making that happen. And then lastly, uh, books again are available for purchase uh, when we're exiting. And so uh, today as every day, it's a great day to be a dragon. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>